will get a question in their head, and it's so intense they'll be able to just walk it in from Lexington, Kentucky. So uh, we have in studio with us, oh, first name again. Ray. Ray uh, from Lex Lexington, Kentucky, who came here with his wife and two sons. Yes. Uh, but he didn't have to pay for a ticket for the two sons. <laughs> they got a free it. ride. They got a free ride. They're still getting a free ride till early June. Uh, uh, Ray, your question for Tim. By the way, she's pregnant with twins, just to be clear. <laughs> yes, okay. in case that wasn't clear what that was all about. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, so Ray. Tim, my question would be, how would yes. you explain the Trinity to someone that has never been acquainted with Christianity or anything like that? Yeah, that is a, a great question. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was a actually at a car wash here in San Diego, and I met a Muslim fellow. He was from going to school at San Diego State University, and he saw me reading my Bible. I was wait waiting for my car, and I was reading my Bible, and he said, excuse me, is that a Bible? And I said, yes. And he had a a thick accent, you mm -hmm. know, I could tell it, it sounded like he was an Arabic speaker. And so I said, where are you from? He said, Saudi Arabia. And he's here studying. And he was fascinated about the, the, the Bible. And he said, so you're a Christian. And I said, yeah. And one of the first things we ended up, I let my car sit for a while because we had a long conversation. So I, can you imagine that me having a long really? conversation? Tim Staples. But, but we did. And one of the biggest issues for him was the Trinity. Exactly this. He, he said, you know, and I asked him, I said, uh, uh, just by curiosity, what do you think about the Trinity? Do you, what do you believe we believe? And he said, well, as I understand it, you guys believe there are three gods. The, the Father is a God, and the Son is a God. And, and so it started there. And I explained, no, that's not what we believe. And what I did, and this is what I would recommend, I used two analogies. For somebody that doesn't believe in the Bible, you know, it, it's not going to appeal to them so much to go to Bible verses and stuff, although if your your friend does believe in the Bible or, or no? It'd be good, I guess, both ways. You both know. ways, yeah. So, I mean, there are certain ways you can do it with, with the Bible. I, I suggest everybody acknowledges the Father is God, mm -hmm. right? So the key is to show biblical texts for somebody who believes in the Bible where Jesus is revealed to be God also verses like John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, without Him was not anything made that was made. I mean, it's very clear that the Word is God, He's the Creator, and, and so forth, and then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in, in John 1, 14. You have verses like Titus 2, 13, we await the manifestation of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's lots of good biblical texts like that that reveal Jesus is God. And then you have biblical texts that reveal the Holy Spirit to be God, too, and there's many of those. For example, in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, you go down to about verse 15, and you see this numerous times in Scripture where uh, the Scripture will say, the Holy Spirit said... And then the quotation is usually from an Old Testament passage where it speaks, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks as God. I am the Lord, for example. I have taken away your sins or I will take away your sins and that sort of thing. So there's lots of biblical ways to do it. But I think for the one who has a conceptual problem, they're going to say, okay, okay, I see the Father's God, the Son's God, the Holy Spirit's God, but how can they all be one God. It looks like there's three gods, right? That's where analogy comes in. And I like to use two main analogies. There are more out there, but St. Augustine's anthropological analogy, I think, is excellent. He uses the analogy, obviously, of man. When we look at a man, we see by nature um, there are relational distinctions within each one of us. For example, let's take me, Tim Staples, as an example. I am, right? I have being. I know intellectually, and I will as well. So I have being, I have knowing, and I have willing. These are three things that are real in all human beings. You can't deny it. Of course, I am. And I know that I am, and I also will to know what I don't know, right? And so these are three really distinct realities. They are relationally distinct, but they subsist in one being. 
And the reason why St. Augustine uses that is that's a great way of helping somebody to see how there can be three relationally distinct realities subsisting in one being. Now, where this falls as all analogies, and we have to understand that, every analogy we use of God is going to fall because God's infinitely beyond us. We can never fully comprehend him. All analogies fail, but it does help us to get at this reality of relational distinctions in one being. However, it fails in this sense. In God, his being, knowing, and willing are each infinite. So infinite, in fact, that they're distinct persons, right? They are infinite and coextensive with one another. My being's not coextensive with my knowing and my willing because I am before I knew anything and I know that I I would like to know a lot more. So I will to know what I don't know. I was before I knew. So we know they're not coextensive, but in God they are and they are each infinite, so radically infinite that they are revealed to be distinct persons, but never, never Uh, destroying this notion that we begin with, that they are relationally distinct from one another. That is, the Father has a relation to the Son, the Father and the Son a relation to the Holy Spirit, and those are real. But they do not destroy the fact that there is one being. There's not three beings, one being. So that's helpful in that regard. However, I like to use the second analogy that the Catechism actually uses in paragraph 2205 in the Catechism, too, of the family, because the family helps us to see not just relationally distinct realities subsisting in one being, but the idea of three persons that all possess the same nature. Because when you look at a family, right? We're looking at a family right here. We got a father and a mom and two children right there, but let's just take one of them. (laughs) So we got father, mother, and child that exist in a family. They are really distinct persons, and yet the babies in her womb have the same nature that you do. Even though they're little tiny guys in there, they have the same nature you do. And so what we see here, we use the analogy of the family to show that there can be three distinct beings, not just persons in a relational sense, but now we've got uh, three distinct beings and three distinct persons who all possess the same nature, okay? It's the baby's not less human than you are or she is. They have the same nature, and yet they're distinct persons. Now, when we look at how this fails, however, it is in this sense. In God, we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are distinct persons. They possess the same nature as well, which we've already seen is reasonable because you three have the same nature. But here's where it fails. In God, Each one possesses the nature of God. See, with you guys, as I mentioned before, your nature is to be one being, right? That's the nature of being human, is you are a distinct being as well as a distinct person. But in God, you have distinct persons, but because their nature is to be God, they have one being, So it's kind of a way, these are analogies, of course. If you put them together, you can see how, yeah, it's reasonable to have these relationally distinct realities that subsist in one being, and it's reasonable to have three distinct persons that all share the same nature. Where our minds get blown is all three of their natures is one nature, and that is God. And that's where our minds get blown. And that's why when we talk about God as person. We're we're using an analogy because he's not a person. He's actually persons, but he's not a person in the same way we are. We can use the analogy of persons to try to get at God, but his personhood transcends anything we can imagine. In the same way, his being transcends anything. You know, this is why the Fourth Lateran Council and its definition of the faith in 1215, the very first thing they did at the council is they wrote up a profession of faith. And one of the principles in the very first part of that council is they said God is ineffable. He's, in fact, they use two Latin terms. He's incomprehensible and ineffable, right? Incomprehensible meaning our minds can't 
comprehend because it's beyond our our powers to comprehend the the infinite and ineffable because his nature by nature is unknowable so he's both incomprehensible because our powers are, are limited, but also ineffable, meaning he's unknowable because he, uh, by anything outside of, of himself. Only God can fully comprehend God. But the good news is we can use these analogies to help folks to be able to get at, oh, I, I kind of see it. And then you get back to Scripture and you get back to Jesus Christ who revealed it to be true. Ultimately, our faith rests upon the person of Jesus Christ who revealed God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know it is true because he's God, and therefore he can neither deceive nor be deceived. So for your walk back to Lexington, that's a lot, lot to think about, but it's a long oh, yeah. walk from San Diego to it Lexington. Is, yeah, so a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you, Ray, for the question. Thanks yeah, very much. Of